Welcome to the Folktale Project, this is Dan Schultz. Today we have part two of the story of Knight Roland, a telling the tale of the famous knight Roland, captured in song and handed down through the generations. But this is a slightly different version of the tale, and one that I truly enjoy. We left off where Roland, the young adventurous knight and nephew of Charlemagne, had finally fallen in love and gotten married. And then he had, of course, been called away to a crusade, because, well, that's just what happens in these tales. And that's where we're picking up. A Crusade into Spain. This is The Knight Roland, Part 2. The Cross and the Half Moon were fighting furiously for the upper hand in Spain. Terrible battles were fought and much blood flowed from both Christians and infidels. Bloody victories were gained by the Emperor's brave knights, the chief of whom was Roland. His sword forced a triumphant way for Charlemagne. It guarded his army, passing victoriously through the unknown country of the enemies. But the sad day of Roncesvalles, so often sung by German and other poets, was yet to come. Separated from the main body of the army, Roland's brave rear guard was making its way through the dusky forest. Suddenly, Wild shouts sounded from the heights, and the cowardly moor pressed down on the little band, threatening them with destruction. But the noble Franks fought like lions. Roland's charger, Brilliador, flew now here, now there, and many a Saracen was hewn down by its noble rider's sword, Durant. But numbers conquer bravery. The little army of Franks became less and less, and at last, Roland sank, struck by the lance of a gigantic moor. The combat continued furiously round him. When night spread mournfully over the battlefield, the infidels had already done their terrible work. The Franks lay dead. Only a few had escaped from the slaughter. Where is Roland? was the frightened cry from pale lips. He was not among the saved. Where is Roland? asked Charlemagne anxiously of his messengers. Through the whole kingdom their answers seemed to resound. Roland the hero had fallen in battle fighting against the Saracens. Wherever this cry was heard, it awakened a deep sorrow. The news soon spread as far as the Rhine, and one day the imperial messengers appeared at the Drachenberg, bringing the sad tidings and the deepest sympathy of the emperor. Herbert sighed deeply on hearing the news and covered his eyes with his hands. Hildegund's grief was heartbreaking. Before the altar of the Queen of Sorrows she lay sobbing her heart out, imploring for comfort in her great need. For days on end she shut herself up in her little bower, and even her father's gentle sympathy could not assuage her bitter grief. Weeks passed. Then, one day, The pale maiden entered the knight's chamber, her grief quite transfigured. He drew her softly towards him, and then she revealed the resolution which was in her heart. Count Herbert was overwhelmed with grief, but he pressed a loving kiss on her pure forehead. The day came when, down below on the island Nonnenwert, the convent bells rang solemnly. The new novice... Count Herbert's lovely daughter knelt before the altar. In the holy stillness of the convent, she sought the peace which she could not find in the castle of her father. With the last great convulsive sob, she had torn her lover's name from her heart, had quenched the flame of sorrowing love for him, and now her soul was to be filled ever with the holy fire of the love of God. In vain her afflicted father hoped that the unaccustomed loneliness of the convent would shake her resolution, and that, when the first year's trial was over, she would return to him. But no. The pious young woman fervently begged the bishop, who was a relation of her father, to release her from the year's trial 
and allow her after a short time to take her final vows. Her longing desire was fulfilled. After a month, Hildegard's golden locks were no more, and the lovely daughter of the Drakenberg was dedicated to the Lord forever. Time rolled on. Spring had vanished, and the sheaves were ripening in the fields. Where the river reaches the end of the Rhine Valley, crowned by the seven giants, a knight with his horse stopped to rest. Far away in the south, where the valley of Roncesvalles lies bathed in sunshine, he had lain in the hut of a poor herd. There, the faithful squire had dragged his master pierced by a Moorish lance. The bold hero and leader had remained for weeks and months on his sickbed, struggling with death, till the force of his iron nature had at last conquered. Roland was recovering under loving care, while they were mourning him as dead in the land of the Franks. Then, having recovered, he hurried back to the Rhine, urged by an irresistible longing. A wooded island lay in the deep blue waters, the setting sun threw a golden light over the hills, numberless vineyards flanked the mountains, hedges of beaches were on one side, the murmurs of waters on the other, and above the pinnacles of a knight's castle among the legendary rocks where once a terrible beast lived, over all the heavens clothed with a garment of silver stars. Silently the knight paused his glance resting admiringly on the beautiful picture. Now, as in months before, an inexplicable feeling of sweet sadness came over the dreamer. Hildegund, murmured Roland, glancing up at the starry heavens. Again, as formerly a boatman rode across the stream, and Roland soon was striding through the forest towards the Drakenberg, accompanied by his faithful squire. The old watchman at the castle stared at the late guest, and crossing himself he rushed up to the chambers of his master. A man's figure, bent with age and sorrow, tottered forward. Roland, he gasped forth. The knight supported the broken-down old man in his arms. When Roland had departed long ago, his grief had found no tears. Now they flowed abundantly down his cheeks. The knight tore himself from the other's arms. Where is she? he asked in a hoarse voice. Dead? Count Heribert looked at him with unspeakable sorrow. Hildegund, bride of Roland, whom they supposed dead, is now a bride of heaven. The hero groaned aloud, covering his face with his hands. In spring he left the Drakenberg and went to the castle on the rocky corner and there he laid down his arms for ever. His thirst for action was quenched. Day by day he sat over there, looking silently down on the green island in the Rhine, where the nun, Hildegund, wandered about among the flowers in the convent garden every morning. Sometimes, indeed, it seemed that she bowed kindly to him. Then the knight's face would be lighted up with a gleam of his old happiness. But. Even this joy was taken from him. One day his beloved did not appear, and soon the death bell tolled sorrowfully over the island. He saw a coffin which they were carrying to its last resting place, and he heard the nuns chanting the service for the dead. He saw them all, only one was wanting. Then he covered his face. He knew whom they were carrying to the grave. Autumn came, withering the fresh green on Hildegund's tomb. But Roland still kept his watch, gazing motionlessly at the little churchyard, as one day his squire found him there, cold and dead, his half-closed eyes turned toward the place where his loved one was sleeping. For many a century the proud castle, which they called Rolandsek, crowned the mountain. Then it fell into ruins, like the mighty Drakenberg, the tower of which is still standing. Fifty years ago, the last arches of Roland's castle were blown down one stormy night, but later on they were built up again in memory of this tale of true and faithful love in the olden times. And that is the end of Night Roland. A love story in the time of the Crusades that 
while it has some, you know, historical truth to it, I like this story where instead of dying in battle, Roland comes back to find his love and then respects her choices and lives watching her, caring for her, and eventually dying. This is Dan Scholes from the Folktale Project. Don't forget that you can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Overcast, anywhere you like to get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at Folktale Project. You can find us on Auto Radio, TuneIn Radio, iHeart Radio, Spotify, anywhere you like to listen. And you can always head over to folktaleproject.com. We'll find a new story waiting for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. As always, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>